two words, trust and obey. Trust is a good word. Obey makes people nervous. I know over the years when I've worked with couples who are planning to get married, the bride often says to me about the uh, wedding ceremony, hey, that, uh, that word obey isn't in there, right? Uh, I don't know of any ceremonies that still have. I guess some do. Wives to be saying, I promise to love, honor, and obey him. Uh, it doesn't fly for most people today. In fact, um, obey is kind of a word that people might associate with, with their pet. You know, I'm training my dog so he will obey me. I am the master and he's to obey me. We get a little nervous sometimes with that kind of talk. But truthfully, when it comes to the, the, the journey of faith and our understanding of what the Bible's message is, the word obey is pretty important. If we talk about the Lord being the Lord, being the Lord of all, then it's uh, kind of a situation where um, there's an expectation for him to have us do what he wants us to do. That's what it means to have him as the center of your life. But human nature always gets in the way. People are always trying to dilute what God has said and kind of tweak it to make it fit our lifestyle, our comfort level. Maybe the best way I can explain what I'm trying to say is that um, when our kids were young, as parents, my wife and I, we wanted them to take vitamins because we wanted our children to grow up strong and healthy. So we got those chewable children's vitamins. And so every morning when they'd have breakfast before they go off to school, we would say, you know, you got to take a vitamin. Well, you know, those vitamins were kind of costly. And since I did the food shopping in the family, I went with the store brand. Now, I never really tried one. But I confess now to you that they probably didn't taste that great. Not like the Flintstone vitamins or some of the name brands. But every morning we dutifully gave our kids vitamins and they took them. Years later, one day my wife and I were sitting around talking. We said, you know, let's, let's move the furniture in the living room. You ever, you ever get one of those days? You just kind of get tired of where your furniture is. Let's move the furniture. Yeah, it's a great idea. Let's move the sofa over there. Okay, so I'm moving the sofa, and oh, what's that little pile of fossilized vitamins? <laughs> from way back. Now, where did that come from? I can't imagine. Well, they were obedient. They took the vitamin, but they didn't consume it. And in some ways, we might receive what the Bible says and take in the message, but we don't exactly live it out or carry it out. That was the problem this guy in the Old Testament had. His name was Saul. And in the book of 1 Samuel, in the 15th chapter, we have this story of how he sort of obeyed God and sort of didn't. And he was the king of Israel, so God kind of had a higher expectation for him as far as his level of obedience. 1 Samuel 15, we have the story of God giving Saul, the king, a specific message. It's a hard message to, to kind of uh, get your mind around because he was telling Saul to go and completely destroy a group of people called the Amalekites. Can you say that word? Amalekites. Very good. You can impress your friends when you leave church and say, I heard a sermon about the Amalekites. The Amalekites were uh, not good people. And if you look back in the Bible to Exodus chapter 17, they kind of sucker punched the Israelites when they were coming out of Egypt. You know, Moses, Red Sea, the whole deal. When he led them out, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites. And it says in Exodus chapter 17, that God would punish the Amalekites for all future generations. And so this is one of those times that God speaks through the prophet Samuel who goes to Saul and gives him the message. Saul, you must go and completely wipe out the Amalekites. This is how it's worded in the Bible. Verse 3. Now go, attack the Amalekites and totally destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men 
and women, children, infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Everything. Now that raises a question that's really a sermon for another day. Why would God ask him to do that? Children and their animals, why does everything have to be wiped out? Well, it's too long to really get into, but one theory from Bible scholars is that since the Malachites were such evil people, they were already lost and separated from God. So in that sense, they were already dead to God. And if any of them were allowed to survive, even the children, they would grow up and become adult Amalekites, and they would continue to torment and attack the Israelites, God's people. And so perhaps that's the reason why, or one of the reasons why, Saul gets this message to go completely annihilate the Amalekites. So Saul gets the message, and in verse 7 it says, He attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, to the east of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive. And all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. So Saul spares the king wipes out everybody else, and when it comes to the livestock, he saves the best stuff for himself and kills all the, all the weak and uh, undesirable livestock. So now there's a problem. Saul had clear instruction from God, and he didn't obey. So now God says to the prophet Samuel, you go and tell Saul that I'm not happy, that he's in the doghouse. So Samuel has this unenviable job of going to the king and saying, what in the world did you do? Verse 13, Samuel reached Saul, and Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. He's feeling pretty happy about himself. He's feeling like he did a good job. He did partially obey. He wiped out the Amalekites, but he saved the king, and he saved the good livestock, and he's thinking, hey, this is better than recycling. These are good animals. We should save them, and uh, we can use them in some way that we want to. But Samuel said, if you follow God's command and did what he said and wiped everything out, verse 14, what then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? If you wiped everything out, then how come I am hearing animal noises? It reminds me of a t-shirt that has a picture of a cat, and the cat kind of has, his eyes are very expressive, very big, and he looks kind of guilty, and his cheeks are puffed out, and he's got bird feathers sticking out of his mouth, and he mutters, bird? What bird? <laughs> cattle? What cattle? Sheep? I don't, oh, those sheep, <laughs> those cattle. Oh, yeah, Saul says, verse 15. The soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. Yeah, they spared the best of the sheep and the cattle to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But we totally destroyed the rest, he says. So, yeah, those soldiers, you know, you just can't tell them anything. They just don't listen. I tried to tell them. Wipe everything out, but no, they had to spare the best sheep and cattle. So the first thing he does is kind of what you and I like to do is like we blame somebody else when we realize we did something we shouldn't have done. Samuel will have none of it. Verse 16, it says, stop. Stop, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Samuel says, look, the excuse is it's not going to cut. Let me tell you what God's thinking about what you did. Saul says, tell me. He's ready to hear it. Samuel said, verse 17, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? You were once just kind of an ordinary guy, and God made you the king. 
And he sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Make war on them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? So he's confronting Saul with his disobedience. And Saul is still trying that selective obedience. Verse 20, but I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites uh, and brought the king back alive. <clears throat> the soldiers took the sheep and the cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. That's why we spared the animals, to offer them as a sacrifice to God. Isn't that a good idea? He's trying to sell the point to Samuel, to Saul, rather. And Samuel says, it may be a good idea, but it's not what you were told to do. And at that point, Samuel lowers the boom on Saul. And this is the point of the story, I guess, and the point of this message. Samuel replied, verse 22, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. There it is. To obey God is better than sacrificing to God. It's good to go to church. It's good to read your Bible. It's good to go to a Bible study. It's good to do religious things. But it says what's better is to obey God. Well, how do we know what God wants? Well, it's a it's a pretty big book, and there's a lot of instruction in there. Jesus boiled it down to two commandments. When he was asked about which is the most important commandments, he said there's really two. The first one is to love God with your all. No other gods, just him. And the second commandment is to love your neighbor. Just two commandments, but those two give us all kinds of trouble when it comes to obeying. Love God first and most. That might work for Sunday morning, and we're doing that as we're gathering, and we're singing, and we're praying, and we're listening to the preacher go on and on. But what about the rest of the week? What about all the other gods that we entertain, whether it's money or power or influence or whatever it is that makes us feel better? We obey, sort of. We say, God, I took the vitamin. I just didn't kind of finish it. It's that selective obedience. Love your neighbor. And Jesus makes it pretty clear that everybody around us is our neighbor. But there again, we like to be selective. Love everybody? Jesus said it's easy to love the people that love you because they're nice to you. He says try loving your enemies. Try loving the people that are mean and nasty. And so we say, you want me to love Democrats? Impossible, yeah. You, you want me to love people on welfare? You want me to love people whose skin color is different than mine? Uh, that's where I draw the line. I take the vitamin, but I'm going to put it under the sofa when you're not looking, God, because I can't go all the way on that. Selective obedience. So what's the big deal? Why do we need to be fully obedient to what God's saying? Because it's God's plan for your life and mine. And God designed you and me. And he knows what's best for you and me. And if we follow the plan, it goes better for us. If you ever buy something and you try to put it together yourself, you've got instructions, but you say, ah, I don't need this. All I need is a wrench and a screwdriver, and I can figure this out. Then you get about halfway through, or maybe you get all the way done, and you've got all these extra screws. And you say, you know what, maybe I should look at those instructions. Maybe I missed something, because this didn't go quite right. Or maybe you think you've put it together and it starts to fall apart. And that's when you say, you know what, yeah, I definitely missed something. Well, if you think it in terms of the Bible being a life plan, it goes better if you follow what God has said, because he knows how it's supposed to go. He knows how the story turns out in the end, and he's trying to tell you and me, go this way. Follow this path, follow this plan, follow these instructions, and in the end, it's going to be better for you. 
one last illustration, and it pains me to use it because it's an illustration regarding the Dallas Cowboys. And I'm an Eagles fan. But anyway, I was reading that uh, Roger Staubach, anybody remember Roger how many? First of all, how many Cowboy fans are in here today? Come on. All right. All right. There's, there's one in every crowd. We have several in this crowd. Well, the Dallas Cowboys years ago had a great quarterback by the name of Roger Staubach, who, by the way, is a believer and a good guy. And uh, he led them to a championship, uh, probably a couple, maybe Dallas fans know. I know 1972 they won the Super Bowl. Anyway, um, Staubach, later in life, after he stopped playing football, talked about how, you know, when he was in the midst of a game, the coach, Tom Landry, would send a play in to tell the quarterback, this is, this is the play I want you to run. You're going to pass or you're going to run. And Staubach talked about how, you know, there were times when Staubach had his own idea about how uh, things should go with the team. That he, uh, he had a different idea about which play should be used. And he struggled sometimes with doing what the coach wanted. But he realized later that when he followed the coach's plan, that things usually ended up working out pretty well. In fact, years later, Staubach would say, and this is a quote, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Kind of works that way for you and me on the faith journey. Once we kind of deal with this issue of obedience and start to follow God's plan, we start to find that harmony and that fulfillment, and we find victory. Because God's plan is all about victory over sin, over death, with the hope of life eternal. It's a pretty good plan. And he's given us some pretty good instructions as a manual, and if we would follow it and be obedient, we'll find all the things that we're looking for, the harmony, the fulfillment, and the victory. And we have an awesome role model in Jesus. Because the Bible says that Jesus was obedient unto death. He followed the Father's plan, which was for him to come down to this earth, put on flesh a God-man, and to allow himself to be murdered on a cross, not just for the sake of dying, but for a purpose, to pay a ransom, to pay a debt that we can't pay. We, we can't forgive our own sins. But when we buy into this plan and we follow the instructions and we obey, we find that his blood, his sacrifice covers us and makes us clean and makes us whole and helps us to find the fulfillment in this life and the hope and the victory in the next life. And we're blessed to have this plan and we're blessed to have a Savior who cares that much for us that he would come and die on the cross for us. And he tried to make that clear to his disciples that night in the upper room in that first time of communion, when the Bible says that Jesus at one point after the supper took some bread and he, he gave thanks and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, broken for you. This is God's plan. This is part of my obedience on your behalf to be broken for you. And it says he also took the cup and uh, he said, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins represents a new covenant, a new arrangement, a new relationship with God. Receive this and remember. And that's why 2,000 years later, we still have this sacrament we call Holy Communion. It's a way of remembering how obedient Jesus was and how he calls us into a life of obedience. And so as we prepare to engage with God through the sacrament of communion, let us pray and be mindful of our need to confess before we receive. Father, if we're honest, and we need to be, we've all done things, said things, thought things we shouldn't. And we ask for your forgiveness. And in this time of sharing the bread and the cup, we pray that you would meet us, that you would bless the bread and the cup and allow it to be an experience of spiritual refreshment for us, that we might be cleansed from the inside and that you might grant us the assurance of forgiveness that... Uh, when the time comes when we leave this place this morning, we might know that we belong to you 
and that to the degree that we follow your plan and we obey, we find the harmony and the fulfillment and the victory that we seek. Come now and meet us, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.